Hi, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jerry Fardell. This is Community Matters, and we have a visit from Trisha Nakamatsu. She's a deputy prosecuting attorney in the city and county of Honolulu. We are delighted to have her on the show. Hi, Trisha. Hi, Jay. Thanks so much for having me. Can I call you Trisha instead of a deputy prosecuting attorney? Please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, appropriate formality here. <clears throat> so, what you know, this, this is a new administration under Steve Ahm. Can you talk about what it's like to be a deputy prosecuting attorney right now? Um, you know, for a lot of the line, uh, line deputies, things haven't changed too much. We do our job day to day. Um, a lot of the assignments are the same as they've been for, uh, from the prior administration. But there is a re definitely reorganization going on. Prosecutor Alm has a vision for his priorities, his policies, and the way he sees things um, that could actually make us more efficient, uh, more accountable, more transparent. Um, so, so things are in flux. We're in a little bit of transition right now, but it's a good time. Yeah, no pressure, but you know, people really judge the quality of justice by how things go in the criminal, uh, you know, in the criminal section of the courts, so to speak. Um, just like they judge uh, how things are going on policing by every single officer they meet, especially the ones they meet after they've been going a little too fast on the highway, those guys. <laughs> and, and, you know, it, 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 whatever happens leaves a long shadow on how people feel about the justice system. So you're part of that. And uh, no pressure. No For pressure. sure. Right. <laughs> right. No problem. <laughs> So, uh, you know, like every other agency, like every other company in Hawaii, um, the prosecutor's office has to watch what happens in the legislature. They want to watch and see what bills are introduced. They, they want to see um, what bills are, you know, good and maybe not so good. And sometimes they want to actually speak to the legislators about that. And no exception, the prosecuting attorney's office for the city and county. So, um, and I think that, you know, it's very interesting and my own view is uh, I really wonder whether we need to do that because it's like an industry. I always thought the legislature was like, you know, Hawaii's really biggest industry. You know, we don't have, uh, <laughs> we don't have you know, sugar and pineapple anymore, but uh, we do have the legislature. <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> like a hidden industry if you think about it, because when I was starting off as a lawyer, it never occurred to me that there was so many people involved in this, in this process. Yeah. So have you walked the halls? Oh, yes, yes. Normally, non-COVID times, that's that's the bulk of my job is just going and talking <laughs> to the legislators, talking to the, all the stakeholders, agencies, and uh, making sure that that we can kind of do our part to help the legislators get the best bills possible. Yeah, well, you know, I'd like to ask you a sort of a general kind of a, a philosophical question. You know, isn't the law, the criminal law, such as it is, fine? just fine. Um, we've been, you know, we, we have the criminal law, the legislature passed these criminal statutes a long time ago. The procedure is well settled in our, in our you know, rules of civil or rather criminal procedure and so forth. Um, why, why do we need to worry about new legislation? Why does anybody need to worry about new legislation in the criminal, in the criminal section of the, of, of the legislature? Well, no doubt when the penal code was passed, it was back in the 70s, I believe. It was a comprehensive package. There was laws about seemingly almost everything and anything, but like anything, human nature is subject to adapt and evolve, and the wording is never quite perfect on every single statute or every single rule. So uh, every year, there <laughs> never fails to be new um, <laughs> statutes created, uh, more ideas on how things can be better. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, well, you know, there's the, the, a lot more the, criminal offenses as well, too. No, but that, I mean, to me, that's um, a mark of democracy. I, I asked a question in a provocative way, but uh, it's a mark of democracy. I mean, for example, the Constitution, the United States Constitution itself. I mean, you know, the, the 18th century was nice, but things have changed. And, okay. and, and things are changing more quickly now. And our society is changing. And we okay. have to change the laws to keep up with the society. Uh, otherwise, um, otherwise, the public. And this is the, you know, the big point, the public loses confidence in the system. And you want the public to be confident of the system. You want the public to feel that whatever happens, it's fair. Absolutely. And that, that's why you got to do what you got to do. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the bills that Prosecutor um, included in our, our legislative package this year are those types of bills that really are helping us move into the uh, catching up with the 21st century here. <laughs> um, 
mean, okay, I'm let's let's catch up. Out. Let's let's take a look. I want to go through the. Um, I have a list from you of it uh, looks like about um, I don't know, about ten bills or so. Uh, some some of them are to observe, and some of them are to care about a lot to the prosecutor. Let's go through them, and I'll and I'll name them, and we can show a very brief um, sort of shorthand statement of what they might might involve. So the first one to discuss, Trisha, is HB one seventy seven. Uh, what is that about? So House Bill 177 was part of our legislative package, and that basically would change it changes the state of mind necessary to prove that somebody knew the victim of sexual assault or their victim of sexual assault was mentally defective. Now that's one of those terms that to our ears nowadays sounds a little archaic or harsh, mentally defective. Um, but it is an actual defined term in the penal code. So we didn't make that up. We didn't choose a term. It's just <laughs> So we were working with what was was in there. Um, and the state of mind would basically be negligent now, which is like, a, you should have known better or you should have realized that this person was of such a condition. Um, because people who are mentally defective are really vulnerable class. Um, by definition, they don't understand the nature of their acts. So if somebody, it seems like maybe they're going along with something or maybe things are, are not, they're not fighting as, as hard as one might expect, a lot of that has to do with the nature of their conditioning. And so we felt so, that that really, um, yeah, deserves a higher level of um, protection. So it's almost new. like minors. Okay. Um, okay. The, the other thing I wanted to ask you about that is uh, there are there are people who are uh, elderly, okay, and they're equally vulnerable, or they're 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 vulnerable to a certain degree. Um, simply by physical frailty, what have you. Mm -hmm. And is there anything in the, in the uh, if any parallel issue or statute in the, in, the, in the criminal law that makes it special when you would attack or um, that you knew or should have known, for example, that a yes. person is frail because he or she is, is elderly? Yeah, well, there is heightened sentencing provision. So if somebody's convicted of certain types of crimes and their victim is either very young under the age of seven, I believe, or eight, or if they're elderly, then they would be subject to mandatory minimums, um, heightened penalties. Um, and all of those are out there to protect these more vulnerable classes. And in theory, people would be offenders would know that you're going to face a much stiffer penalty um, if you even try to harm these folks. Um, we, have, we have hate crimes here, don't we? We do as well, yes. Hate crimes are primarily is more tends towards um, like nationality, religion, things like that. If it can yeah. be proven that that was the basis for the for the crime, yeah. Uh, also, this, heightened, uh, heightened penalties on the mainland. You know, there's plenty of that. Even yesterday, uh, which is really sad that people do that. The brutal crimes against elderly people, Asian people. It's incredible that they do that. Anyway, um, not going to happen here because we're going to prosecute them. Good. <laughs> <laughs> There's a um, number of other bills. Uh, there was a Kapuna yeah. Caucus bill that also passed this year with heightened penalties. So all of the crimes committed against Kapuna, uh, Kapuna are elderly, um, will also face heart pressure penalties. Um, and I believe they decreased the age across the board. Well, made it uniform to 60 years of age or older is now considered elderly for purposes of, of those bills. Yeah. These kinds of bills come from the prosecutor's office, right? I mean. You, you guys want to tune it up. Um, you know what defenses people put out. You know what, um, you know what, what comes up in the courtroom, so to speak. And uh, you don't want any, any unfair situation where a, a person was victimized and, and, and it's hard to get a, 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 a conviction. No? Absolutely. And that's what we base our package on. The Kapuna Caucus bill was, I believe, from Maui prosecutors. Uh, but we work with them as well and our elder abuse team um, monitored and testified on those bills too. So we all, all the different counties kind of keep tabs on each other's bills. We support each other, give each other feedback and it works out really well because these are going to be statewide laws. Right, right. Important to know um, that you guys collaborate. I really like that. And, and also that these are state, everything you do is statewide. I mean, in terms of the criminal code, the criminal law. Okay, let's go to HB 181. Um, and this is about um, the definition of property. Can you talk about it? Yes, this is one of those updating 
um, bringing our laws up to real life standards. And it's basically a basic definition of property to include anything in the electro electronic medium, as you see. But that basically means data, um, anything that can be retrievable in written format, but is stored electronically. Say somebody steals a thumb drive, now, but the knowledge or the data that's on that thumb drive could be worth thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. The thumb drive, five dollars, ten dollars. So there's a disconnect there, especially if we can prove that there was an intent or knowledge to take what was on the thumb drive and not just that little device. Uh, we actually have had to turn down cases um, or severely downgrade cases for the, that very reason, which is why we felt this is important to, to modernize our definitions in this way. You know, that's one of those things that's changed and is changing in our society, all the things around computers. And of course, there's, there's hacking and uh, you know, stealing data, there's um, you know, all the terrible things you can do to somebody, ruin his life, identity theft, what have you. And it and, um, strikes me that mm, we need to have a lot of prosecutions and we have to make sure that um, the criminal code provides for appropriate punishments on these things because we really have to stamp it out. I mean, it, it's not too much we can do to somebody who is, um, you know, doing this uh, from a faraway place, you know, Eastern Europe, for example, we would have trouble stopping him or her. But, but if it's local, wow, we want to we wanna make sure that doesn't happen locally. For sure, for sure. Yeah. Okay, well, that's, that's good. That's, a, that's in the right direction. So far, I really like these bills. Did these two pass? Uh, yes, these were both uh, passed all the way through session and transmitted to the governor. So they're on his desk waiting for signature. Okay. Governor, you should sign these bills. I'm just, you know, because I know he watches us all the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Senate Bill 412. Now, this one you introduced in the Senate, not the House. Um, and this is about uh, implied consent. Um, and you use the word Trump here. I find that an interesting word. Can you, can you uh, describe this? <laughs> That's not a legal this? term, of course. <laughs> 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 Can you describe this bill, Tricia? Um, that was just my shorthand for this bill. Um, what happens, it, well, that portion of the bill basically clarified that the implied consent law in Hawaii says that everybody who drives a car, gets their driver's license and is driving on the road, gives their consent, implied consent, to, be, to give a breath or blood alcohol test if they're pulled over or driving under the influence. Now, the thing is, technically, you can withdraw that consent and you can just say, I'm not going to, if you get pulled over, you're under arrest for DUI, I'm not going to take the test. You can refuse. So that was starting to become a problem because of some of the case law that's been developing over the years. But what was we found is that search warrants could actually be used for as um, to obtain that evidence, because that is, in fact, what the breath and blood alcohol measurements are, they're evidence for a DUI case. So there was some confusion on Maui about one of the courts, whether a search warrant could actually be used if someone has said, I don't give my, I withdraw my consent. But the conclusion that most people have reached, um, we felt was clear cut and just perhaps needed this extra statutory clarification was that implied consent law does not, quote unquote, trump the uh, ability of for courts to issue search warrants. That if a court finds by probable cause that a search warrant is necessary to obtain this information, that it could disappear if it's not gotten right away, then a search warrant should be granted. And, and that's one of the main changes here in this law. The other oh, part of, oh yeah. I'm that's sorry, there was another part of this bill though. This is Senate Bill 412. And this was that uh, habitual DUIs could not be deferred. Um, and that's just one of those things. Deferral is, or criminal law is basically like a, rather than entering their plea right now, a defendant can wait a certain period of time and say, I'm gonna take my deferral, um, deferred acceptance of a guilty or no contest plea. And they are basically telling the court that this was a one-time thing. I will learn my lesson. I will be a good, boy or good girl <laughs> and not do anything wrong um, again. I've, I've learned my lesson. What will happen is then if they wait, if they're able to follow the rules, not get arrested, 
are convicted um, for any other crimes and they meet whatever conditions the court puts on them, uh, maybe attending drug or alcohol treatment, um, getting drug tested, alcohol tested, mental health counseling, whatever it is that the court feels they need to be able to prove that they really have learned from this. Um, after that, that period is over, then the case will be dismissed, almost like it never happened. Um, but we just felt that habitual OVI or DUIs in particular are so serious and notably, First and second offense, DUIs cannot be deferred. So we didn't see there was any reason that someone now on their third offense, habitual DUI, should be allowed to defer their, their plea. No, really, it's a different situation. It's like dealing with a kid. If he keeps on breaking the rules, you, you have to make it more clear than you did before. <clears throat> so the question, where does, where does this information live and who presents it to the court? And when is it presented? Is it presented on issues of guilt or innocence or um, presented on, um, you know, sentencing? Uh, the prior offenses, you mean? Yes. Oh, yes. Um, so that the court keeps all that information. They have records on convictions and charges. Um, I believe uh, CJ, uh, criminal justice information uh, is maintained by the AG and they have an entire unit dedicated to maintaining that information as well. Okay, so the judge himself or herself can, can go look it up from, from the computer, the state computer system? The uh, yes and no. I mean, we still have to prove you have it to present from a standing it. court, yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah, because it could be a mistake. Yeah. And so you want to you have a, a little, a moment of due, due process on that. <laughs> Always due process. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, by the way, I want to I want to add one thing. Some of these are uh, HB, HB House bills, some of them are Senate bills. So I take it that when you introduce the bill, when the prosecutor introduces the bill, it's in both both places. They're companions all the time, and that's they right. they go from both directions. Yeah, that, yes. that's customary. Okay, let's go to the next one. Um, this is Senate Bill four one three. This is about privacy. It's a very interesting topic these days. Can you talk oh. about this one four one three? Yes, definitely. Violation of privacy. So this is similar to the last bill that we talked about in so much as it would prevent people from getting a deferral on these particular violation of privacy cases. Um, violation of privacy is kind of a, an amorphous term for most people, but under our laws, this is not the ones that we're talking about are not like a keeping Tom or that type of low level offenses. These are people who are setting up devices uh, camera video equipment um, to watch people in a state of undress or to record it, to broadcast it, um, either undressing or engaged in sexual activity in a situation where there is a serious expectation of privacy. Um, this is not something they don't have knowledge or consent of being watched or recorded, certainly. Um, and so we also didn't feel that those people should be entitled to a deferral to be able to ever wipe this from their. Um, criminal history to the extent that they could say it's like it never happened. Um, the victims of these crimes, and I'm sorry, another part of that offense is that it could also include threats to disclose those images. So revenge porn, um, things like that. Once these things are out there on the internet, they, they are never going away. Um, the victims of these types of crimes have to live with it forever. They have to live with it knowing that it could pop up somewhere, someday, in multiple places. And so even more so, we didn't, felt, we didn't feel that the offenders should be able to forget about it um, as soon as they're one year, five years, or however long. Of, yeah, um, well, that that's really sounds like a good change, a, a good improvement on that. Again, it's, uh, we live in a time where computers and technology like that, call it eavesdropping, technology is readily available. And uh, there are people who do that, I'm sure, I am sure, Tricia, you tell me if I'm wrong, I am sure that you have cases uh, about um, peeping toms and uh, oh, violations of privacy. Right, and, and these really are so much more than that because like it is, um, like I mentioned, is these are people who are actually setting up camera equipment, video equipment to watch people in undressing, getting naked and sexual activity, things that should never, you know, there was never an, any, um, desire for that to be made public. Right. Huh. <clears throat> creepy comes to mind, the word creepy. But I don't think <laughs> creepy is in the statute. So. 
to say the least, right? <laughs> ultimate, ultimate creepy. Yes. Well, threatening people, you know, to release the information is much more than creepy. <laughs> For sure. um, okay, let's go to the next one. Um, this is uh, about guardian, guardian ad litems or guardian, guardians ad litem is proper, I suppose. Uh, HB 345, what's that one do? So this was one of the bills, not part of our package, but something that we supported. The um, it, Prosecutor Alm feels very strongly that treatment, mental health treatment, drug treatment, that really is the, the key to decreasing crime and to making a permanent change for a lot of these people who um, probably would not be offenders if they had the proper treatment, if they were no longer on drugs, if they were getting proper counseling. So this is one, one of the bills that we supported that would require a guardian ad litem be appointed to represent someone who is part of this the ACT um, proceedings. And ACT stands for Assisted Community Treatment. Somebody who is not so mentally ill that they need to be at the state hospital or um, hospitalized against their will, so, so to speak, but really need, have been ordered to attend treatment. Um, and I don't, and there's just, their, um, I'm sorry, their diagnosis or their condition is such that re they require regular treatment to ensure that they're not a danger to others, to ensure that they are staying on their medications, obtaining tre necessary treatment. Sometimes they're in such a state that they don't realize they need that help. And so guardian ad litem would basically help to stand in for them, to assist them as needed and make sure that process can still keep moving forward. Well, how do I get into this assisted community uh, uh, treatment program? Do I have to apply? As a guardian I'm like, I'm, 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 No, as a, as a person in the program. Oh, somebody who's uh, mentally ill. Yeah. Um, the law was changed a few years back so that um, a, any, any interested party can basically um, ask for somebody to be considered for these ACT. And the judge has to Like decide. a family member, a close family member. Um, could be police, law enforcement. Um, yeah, there's a number of different avenues for this assisted community treatment. So, um, and a judge has to decide. And at that point, the judge, under this bill, um, uh, the law would require the judge right there and then, I suppose, to appoint a guardian for this person. Um, and um, the guardian, what, <clears throat> from whom, what pool of people would you get the guardian? And what would the guardian do to, to uh, I guess, be the guardian of the individual who's in the assisted community treatment program? Well, it's a uh, guardian ad litem is just slightly different uh, from a guardian. Um, they're not a legal guardian for purposes of taking care of their affairs in any respect, other than just representing them and being there for them with regards to these proceedings. Um, but I believe there is a guardian ad litem program with the courts where people can sign up. Lawyers might be interested in assisting. Um, they can be guardian ad litems. Um, I believe it's a paid, paid um, work. Um, and so they, many of them are lawyers and they can provide, uh, they wouldn't provide legal counsel, of course, but they would basically be like an advocate more on a personal level for that mm -hmm. person. So you said this was not a, a bill that was in the... Uh in the bills, the group of bills that the prosecutor uh, submitted to the legislature. Um, is this a good bill? And how's oh, it doing? Yes, we, we strongly supported this bill throughout the session as we do a number of other bills. Um, there was another sex trafficking bill, I think that was on our list that was actually introduced by the AGs and we are a strong supporter of that as well. Um, my job, as well as my partner at the prosecuting attorney's office, we go through every single bill, literally every single bill that gets a hearing. Um, at the Capitol every session, and we just review it for anything that might be relevant to our department. It's of interest to the prosecutor. Um, and like I said, these treatment-oriented bills are, are definitely high on his priority list. You ever find a bill that uh, did not come from any prosecuting attorney's office anywhere in the state, did not come from the attorney general's office in the state, and it just came out of left field? Um, that, uh, and what happens? What kind of a bill can we expect from left field? <laughs> that's just about every session you'll you'll have a bunch of them coming up but anybody can talk to their legislators about introducing bills if they think there's a change that needs to be done um made to the law they should definitely go and reach out to their legislator their representative or senator and 
see what can be done to make these changes. It might be a statutory change. It might be something that just needs to be um, altered in the process or the way things are carried out, perhaps. But when there is a change, any of the legislators can introduce bills. Um, the agencies are very fortunate that the Senate President and House Speaker introduce our packages um, by request as a courtesy. Um, but really, all of the legislators introduce a number of bills every year. And mm -hmm. actually, I believe this guardian ad litem was introduced by House Speaker Psyche. I'm not sure who prompted it, but it was a good bill, so we supported it. Well, I, you know, I, I really wonder, uh, um, you know, is, are all the bills so far that we've talked about, what, half a dozen of them, uh, did, did they pass? Are they all on the governor's desk? Yes, these particular bills are all passed. Um, of course, there were dozens, hundreds of other bills that uh, tried to make it through the process and didn't get all the way. Some of them were tabled for next session or future sessions, more discussion between stakeholders. Maybe they just needed a little more fine tuning or um, just needed to completely go back to the drawing board and so they didn't get through. Oh, really is, it, is this the first or the second year of the biennium now? This is the first year. So that means that a bill that didn't pass, it didn't have enough you know, support or whatever, uh, didn't pass, but we'll come back next year. I suppose there are some like that here in the, in the in, you know, in the criminal code section too. That's right. Technically, any of the bills that did not pass this year will live on until next session uh, next year, and they'll have another chance then. Or people can also introduce a totally new bill with the exact same wording if they like. Um, but well, these they, bills they, will live on even if they don't pass. They say you know a lot of people who introduce bills are prepared to have it go a couple of years. There's some bills go mm, three, four, five years before they actually either get passed or die, really die. Um, oh. And I guess the question is, that, you know, for me, I think most people in the state support what the prosecutor wants because they are law and order people. They want law and order. They want to give you, you know, whatever discretion, whatever fine tune, tune up things that you want. They want to give you that. So I would imagine you don't have a lot of opposition. And I would imagine that the legislature, you know, gives you plenty of deference. Am I right? Um, we do. We do. We are very fortunate to have support and good relationships with a number of other stakeholders, with a lot of the legislators. Um, but let me tell you, it is a it is a grueling process. <laughs> um, <laughs> there, um, we often um, have serious discussions with the public defender's office, the ACLU, a number of other organizations that. Um, don't always see eye to eye with the way that we see things, but that's what the legislative process is all about. And the legislators take in all this information, all the input. Um, we hope they give um, some weight to our, our <laughs> side of things. Um, <laughs> we think they do. How, how did you uh, get into this, Tricia? How did you get yeah. into the prosecutor's office and prosecution? And then from there, how did you get into you know legislative work like this? I mean, we, we, where, where did it dawn on you that you wanted to do this? Oh gosh, you know, this was actually kind of, it just landed on my lap by chance. And I'm so lucky that it did. Um, I previously worked at the Department of Corporation Council. And at one point I was ready for a change. I was asked to come over to join the prosecutor's office then um, under the, the new Kaneshiro administration. And one of the things that I'd wanted to do when I left the Department of Pros uh, uh, Corporation Council was to really spread my wings, do something totally different. And of course, coming to criminal law was a big change in itself. But when there was an opportunity to do legislative work, um, I'd done some advising for the city council when I was at park council, but nothing to this extent um, where I really get to testify on behalf of the prosecutor. I work with the legislators, the different stakeholders, working groups. It's great. It's the creative side of law. Um, that's what mm -hmm. I really like about it, is that you're not just stuck with um, what's existing. And, and that's what a lot of litigators like, is they like the rules, they like the case law and the precedent. Um, but this is is kind of a reform, just yeah. whatever yeah. people can think of. Yeah. You're making law and you're having, you're casting a shadow for years to come. And you're changing the system with the changes in the society. Uh, it's, it's a tremendous contribution, I think. Uh, and I envy you that. So uh, we, we have three or four more bills, but we don't have the time. And I, I don't know what I'm going to do about it. I'm going to bang my head on the wall about that. But uh, <laughs> may, maybe next time, Tricia, we can talk about some more of these bills and some more of the issues that you find uh, that may deserve legislation. 
Uh, I think that's very interesting what you do. And I, again, I want to say, as I said before, that public confidence is everything. And in the, in the Supreme Court building of New York State, New York State in, you know, Bully Square, Lower Manhattan, it, it, it recites Washington's statement as the firmest pillar of uh, justice is the, the public confidence um, and the fair administration of justice is public confidence. And uh, I might have mangled that quote, but it's something like that. And, and, and a lot of it falls on the prosecutor. The prosecutor gives us confidence that we walk down the street, we will be safe, and we will, you know, and the government will take care of us. This is so important. And you're right there on both levels. We really appreciate that, Tricia. <laughs> thank you very much for showing up at Think Tech, and thank you for this thank discussion. You. Thank you so much for having me, Jay. Really appreciate it. Tricia Nakamatsu. Deputy Prosecuting Attorney for the City and County.